Okay, I'd like to call the meeting of the uh, Public Safety Appropriations Committee to uh, order. And first off, I'd like to apologize for being late. I was in a committee hearing and it was my bill and it started at three o'clock. They let me go first and it took an hour and 10 minutes. And uh, it may take me just a little while to catch my breath as I ran across the street, but uh, I appreciate your patience and uh, I, uh, let, let's move forward. I call on Chairman Lumsden to give a blessing before we begin. If you would bow with me, please. Our dear Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your goodness to us and for watching over us and caring for us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given to each of us to be here in this role today. We ask that you would give us your wisdom and your guidance and ask that the things that we do might be pleasing to you and might uh, be beneficial for the, all of the people of the state of Georgia. For we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, first up is... Uh, They're, they're, I guess they're always first, uh, the Supreme Court. <laughs> Mr. Chief Justice. Which one is that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to present the Supreme Court's fiscal year 23 budget. Uh, I'm honored to, to be with you and the members of your committee. Uh, and I'm honored to be uh, joined today by Chief Justice, Chief Justice David Namius, uh, our fiscal affairs uh, representative, uh, Regina Jones, and of course our, our clerk of court, T. Barnes, who if I'm, I'm unable to answer your questions, I'm sure they'll be able to handle it. Um, I know you're working off the governor's worksheet, which is page six, um, and I'll go through these items with you. Um, Happy to answer questions uh, along the way or at the end if you have any. So <clears throat> in section 10, items 1.1 through 1.5 are required and passed through items. Um, I covered these briefly in the amended budget, but I'll cover them again now. 1.1 um, is uh, gonna require an increase uh, from what was uh, originally in the governor's budget of 20,078. That number's now been adjusted to include uh, changes in the uh, covered daily allowance days and commute mileage for a new justice and for other justices. The change there is that number is now 53,954 and that covers again increased amounts necessary to cover changes in the daily allowance days and uh, for the additional justice, Justice Colvin, as well as for additional justices on the court. Uh, item 1.2 is an annualized amount. It is an increase for the justices' ERS plans, plus an increase in the FY23 employer rate, um, and that amount remains consistent with what was in the original budget. Next, item 1.3 is an annualized adjustment to agency premiums for the Department of Administrative Services administered self-insurance programs. That amount remains consistent with what we've previously presented. Item 1.4 is a revised request. We had originally requested on that line $2,189. That is an annualized increase in a, for, uh, for a salary adjustment of the Georgia State Trooper um, in light of pay raise issues and I increases in those costs. That number is now 10584 Last pass through and required amount is um, simply a request in legal research contract fees as that rate has gone up and that rate remains the same at 684. So those are the required pass-throughs uh, and um, amounts. Next, item 1.6 is the restoration of the FY21 cut. That re amount remains the same as previously presented by the governor's budget. Next, uh, we have some enhancement requests. Uh, item 1.7 is a request long time coming uh, and needed for one floating staff attorney position at the Supreme Court to assist really across chambers, uh, all nine chambers, with extensive workload and to handle workload for an individual justice when one of the justices staff attorneys or law clerk is, is on family leave. The amount uh, there includes the $5,000 pay raise that has been proposed by the governor. Uh, and that is uh, 159708 is the total for that request on 1.7. 1.8 is a enhancement request 
for two central staff attorney positions at the Supreme Court. One of those positions is to pr handle pro se filings. Uh, you might be surprised, as I was, to find that 40% of the filings that we get at the Supreme Court are by pro se litigants. They're creating quite a bit of work uh, to review those filings um, and to respond to pro se litigants um, on pro se matters. So one of those is to handle pro se matters, self-represented and prisoners uh, and some habeas cases. The second position would be a regulatory position. As you, as you know, the Supreme Court of Georgia has administrative responsibilities relative to the Office of Bar Admissions and the State Bar in Bar Discipline cases. And we also have discipline authority over judges relative to our role with the JQC. Um, I would remind the, the members of the committee that judicial discipline cases are up. Um, and so we need some assistance in screening those in our central staff um, as those come up. In addition, probably not known to many, but the JQC rules provide that the clerk of the Supreme Court also serves as the clerk to the JQC. And so she's essentially a trial court clerk. All the hearing panel matters, the uh, contested hearing panel matters that are before Judge McBurney and his panel, um, including discovery and motions and everything else, have to be handled by our clerk. Um, and so that is quite a bit of responsibility, particularly with an uptick in judicial discipline cases being, being handled by the Judicial Qualifications Commission. That request to include the $5,000 pay raise for state employees is $319,417. Um, I then move to better news, item 10.1.9. We had originally requested in the uh, FY23 budget a 3% salary adjustment for law clerks at the top of our staff attorney pay scale. Um, the last 2% increase was in 2018. Uh, we were requesting $72,773. We're withdrawing that request and deferring that and, and hope to bring that back to you maybe next year, but we're, we're withdrawing that request from this, this budget request. In addition, um, there's another amount, uh, item 1.10, which is the purchase of enterprise document management software. That's really digital archive software to allow us to, uh, to digitally and cloud-based store uh, much of our HR and fiscal records, and that amount remains unchanged. The last three amounts are as requested by OPB and include the following. Um, the last one item is we're, we're asking for 648211, which includes the annualized $5,000 pay, pay raise for uh, cost living adjustment for full-time benefit eligible state employees. Uh, that would be the first COLA in 14 years. Um, second, we're asking for uh, an enhancement uh, to establish through the employee's retirement system uh, contributions for the payout for forfeited leave so it won't create a liability on our agency. We're having to pay out a lot of leave that's, that we're not prepared for. That's 584671. And then lastly, in order to accommodate that that doesn't occur again is uh, an amount of 123169, which would allow employees to withdraw up to 40 hours of eligible leave as pay on an annual basis so it wouldn't accrue and ultimately result in this contingent liability to our court. So I'm happy to answer questions. That is the budget request from the Supreme Court, and we appreciate your favorable consideration. Any questions? Do we have any questions? Representative Holcomb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Justice Boggs. Um, one, of, one of the themes that we've heard repeatedly has been on the issue of turnover of personnel. Can you just describe for um, your staff, uh, do you have fairly low turnover rates? Or are you able to retain your people, your law clerks, attorneys, et cetera, um, things like that? Yeah, you were, very, you were very kind a couple years ago to fund a term clerk position for us, which by its name is a term position that only lasts a year, and so those folks are in and out usually within a year. Um, but by and large, we don't have a lot of turnover at our court, a lot of job satisfaction at our court. Um, it, it does change from time to time when there are new judges and new justices on, on all, both appellate courts. And so ultimately that can result in some changes and some moving from maybe chamber staff to central staff, uh, central staff, staff. Uh, but in any event, not a high, not a high rate. Okay. To my Thank knowledge. you. You're welcome. Fair amount of turnover of justices. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And I, I regretted yeah. reading the paper the other day. Of <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, I hate to see you go. Uh, we do too. Thank you. Right. Any any other questions from any committee members? 
hearing none, I appreciate your being so uh, efficient and succinct. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Thank you. Court of Appeals. Do I say Colonel Hitchens and Judge Gunner or Chairman Hitchens and Representative Gunner? Well, in, in more un informal uh, locales, I say something else, but I'm not going to say it here today. So <clears throat> I've been called a lot of things, and either one's very appropriate. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Brian Rickman. I'm currently the Chief Judge of the Georgia Court of Appeals. This is my first time appearing in front of you, and as I told, uh, present with me is our CFO, Mr. Chris Walker, who came to us from Corrections. Also, Christina Smith, our Deputy Court Administrator, and Mr. John Ruggieri with our IT department so that we can answer questions you have. As I told Mr. Walker, it is a good thing about our democracy, and it is probably healthy for judges and justices to have to appear before other bodies and answer questions to keep us uh, a little bit humble. I will go straight into our FY23 request. Uh, to echo what Justice Boggs said, you will see on your sheets on the first uh, page increase of funds for the staff attorney salary scale. That request mimicked exactly what the Supreme Court did. Um, they have been wonderful to us. We have worked together to try to keep parity between our staff attorneys so we don't see a lot of shifting back and forth. Uh, we can withdraw that request in the amount of $85,217. That is based on, and we hope for your favorable consideration in the $5,000 pay raises that all state employees are, are uh, looking to get. The remaining items, Mr. Chairman, you will see are largely, if not all, related to cybersecurity. Uh, these are a number of enhancements and improvements to keep our network safe. As you have seen from other agencies, if we have learned anything during the pandemic, uh, number one, everybody's network is vital, but when you have folks working from home, when you have attorneys remoting in to file things, that network is even more crucial than ever and we are trying to do everything we can to protect that network. It is also more vulnerable when you have double to triple the amount of people logging in from offsite. These enhancements, we can answer questions about individually, but the bottom line is as follows. Many of them are designed, in fact, to help reduce the rate of increase of our cyber insurance premiums, because the more we do on the front end uh, through underwriting when they see that, the less we have to pay for cyber insurance later. Mr. Chairman and members. Also, by using these tools, uh, technology has to be leveraged, and the more of those tools we use, actually the fewer IT staff we have to hire. It can be a money saver in that way as well. And uh, the pricing here comes, uh, to reassure you, comes from what the Georgia Technology Authority pays for these services to their contractors. That's what we have estimated on. And finally, a brief word about cyber uh, insurance in particular. There is a committee currently chaired by Justice Charlie Bethel working with our court with a goal. They are aggressively studying how we can save taxpayer funds together by getting global cyber insurance policies so you don't have to appropriate money to everybody. That is ongoing. The reason we have not uh, gotten there yet, as you might imagine, those underwriters want to know every detail of every network, and Georgia has a hodgepodge of networks. Some judges use county networks. Uh, there's the state network, and the level of detail is uh, increasing, and you have to work with all the councils, the superior court, the magistrate courts, but that is ongoing, and we hope in the future, uh, Justice Bethel, I don't want to speak for him, but that committee, which is made up of members of all courts, will be able to put together good protection and uh, that costs a little bit less because we're including more people in the pool. Uh, to echo one other item that Justice Boggs mentioned, this is not in your submission. Um, it just came to our attention. Justice Boggs mentioned there was a, a change in the per diem rates that happened. Our per diem rates, just like the Supreme Court's, are tied to those of the General Assembly. That came to our attention late. We apologize. I have the numbers for you that we would like to ask for in uh, FY23. That number would be 88,000. 
uh, and $95. That number, Mr. Chairman and members, assumes the way we budget was we assume every judge claims the maximum amount under law they're entitled to. I can tell you that hasn't happened since I've been there, but we have to budget for that. And we also now have uh, just announced Judge Land from Columbus coming, and so we budgeted that in as well. And I apologize that wasn't there, but wasn't in there, but we were late to the party. And finally, two closing remarks. I'll close and certainly take any questions to um, address Representative Holcomb's previous question. Um, in case you wanted to know about our, tur our turnover, we have been extremely fortunate. We have very low turnover. I think um, the main reason is quality of life reasons. We can't offer the money, but uh, in terms of quality of life, uh, we're able to offer those things because, for instance, in my chambers, I have a lot of working moms, and they're able to work from home, they're able to write, they're able to research without uh, as much of the, uh, the day to day struggles of private practice in terms of scheduling. Uh, but we have maintained, and that's uh, not to, not to, um, kiss up too much, but you have helped us do that by helping us maintain a fairly competitive salary scale with the Supreme Court because the people we're all competing for at high level writing can go lots of other places, but that trade off is that quality of life. Um, and finally, a little bit about workload. Uh, the tsunami that is in the trial courts has not hit us yet. As you might imagine, there's a lag time before those cases hit us. We have not uh, sought ARPA funds yet to deal with the backlog as Justice Boggs chairs a committee that is handling those ARPA funds. There will be a time in the future when we will do that for some temporary positions, but in keeping with our colleagues on the Supreme Court, we recognize that it's our trial courts right now that need to be in that first round of funding. They're the front lines, and that's where the game is at right now in terms of picking up pace. And I thank you for your attention, and uh, we're here to answer any questions. Do we have any questions from the committee? Representative Holcomb. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chief Judge. Uh, is there still an issue with one judge being suspended, or has that been resolved? And if not, do you have a sense of the time frame on that? It has not been resolved. Um, that judge is still suspended uh, procedurally. That uh, is pending before the hearing panel. And that would then, whenever there is a resolution there, move on to review by the justices of the Supreme Court, uh, which certainly is why I'm being very careful in what I say so I don't say anything out of line in front of them. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, once again, we thank you for coming. You were, you were uh, very adroit, and uh, I, think, uh, <clears throat> I think you did a great job. Thank you, sir. The Superior, Superior Court. Mr. Chairman and members, uh, today we have uh, our Executive Director, Mr. Weathers, uh, Charles Miller, who is vital in this process, is here, as is Deborah Nesbitt. Normally, Judge Art Smith would be here, our President-elect from Columbus. He's been a little under the weather and so he is not here today. We are on page five of your overall outline and we do have a handout that I'm going to address that was sort of a late addition or a, 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 an observation. Uh, I think Mr. Groom knows about that. Start with 9.9.1. I know that I'm not gonna insult your intelligence. We were here just the other week, but we have sort of a three-part budget. The council office, the district court administrators, and then the judge's budget, three separate pieces make up our budget. In 9.1.1, um, that is a request that we had made uh, in November before we knew anything about any the, 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 the intentions of the governor relative to um, trying to retain some of our quality people that we have. My executive committee sort of charges me with what to do. We have not voted because until everything, the ink is dry, you know, it's still up in the air, but we are realists and we are team players and we understand that if that is, if we are fortunate enough to be included among the number who are to receive a $5,000 raise, we, we're, we understand that you will probably allocate this, these funds elsewhere. Is that a good way to say that? Um, and under 9.2.1, we move to the district court administrators, or JADs. 
9.2.1, in 2020, their funds, almost all of their operating funds were cut. That They really had a very difficult time supporting the judges as they do in a lot of the districts. And some of the districts, they are the only technical and, and back support that, that the judges have. In other districts, they, they have different roles, I guess. But in that, we are asking that you, because we had, we had uh, district court administrators who lost their offices, they couldn't afford to pay for them. They couldn't afford to travel because they couldn't get to where they needed to do. But this was all during the beginning of the pandemic and we didn't know what was coming. So that was the cut that, that had to be made and we understood that, but they just sort of sheltered in place and did all that they could. We're asking that you restore uh, them back to the only where they were pre-pandemic and that is the number reflected in 9.2.1. In 9.2.2, that also is going to be the same uh, if we are to be if graciously included in the $5,000, we understand that you will probably allocate those funds elsewhere. In 9.3, we begin what we call the judge's budget, and 9.3.1, .2, .3, and .4 are essentially pass-throughs. In other words, we have a little less money than what we had budgeted that we have to do an employer contribution, so there's some money coming back this way. And we have three judgeships that are already up and running and approved. This is just the rest of the year for them. Now, 9.3.5, .6, and .7, all are bills that have either passed or are pending either in this House or in the Senate and our opinion in the Senate, and those were for the three judgeships that we had asked to fund for this particular um, budget request, and that would be a half year as to each of those. I guess it's a full year. It's a full year as to each of those. I'm sorry. It's a full year as to each of those. 9.3.8, the senior judges, as you know, we are able to access some ARPA funds to, to get senior judge help, but they are limited. We can't do they, they are to be targeted to, senior, to serious violent felonies or the offset of, se of serious violent felonies. So we are asking that we have the, the 10 days be restored because in addition to the ARPA problem, a lot of our circuits didn't get ARPA funds. A lot of our circuits either didn't ask for them or based upon this representation that we would have it in this budget, didn't ask because they, they, they didn't need as many. So this was a, a request that we would go to 10. I think at one point we had gotten to 15 pre-pandemic and we're asking for a restoration to 10. 9.3.9 um, .9 is the same. If the judges are to be included in the raise, we, would, we understand you're probably gonna allocate these funds elsewhere. 9.3.10 is that same pass through that I still don't understand that ERS, if we have someone who retired from ERS who becomes a judge, we have to pay something back to ERS. It is a pass through, it's pretty solid that that is what we are to do and that is a pass through number. Um, now the handout is now gonna come at 9.3.11. Again, we are very hopeful that our law clerks will be um, included in the $5,000 raise, but more towards the points that were initially made by Representative Holcomb. We need to get staff attorneys, law clerks, whichever phrase is used, to a starting salary of $50,000. That five in that first number helps us attract people. I don't know if you remember from the budget we just, we, you passed through for the amended year budget, there were a lot of positions we could not fill. And I understand as we talked to uh, Representative Williams last time and Representative Green last time, there were some concerns that getting some of these staff attorney positions filled in some of our more, especially, particularly in some of our more rural areas, we're gonna have to at least be competitive somewhat with the starting pay. We're, our pay is nothing like what, what would work with appellate courts or whatever, but just to have just sort of a sense of this, of our law clerks, who work with us one year or less, it's 49%. Two years or less, 56. Three years or less, 67. So we are having almost constant turnover. And we understand part of that is just the way it's designed. You're not trying to create a career for a, a whole position, but 
trying to get these positions filled uh, can be truly problematic. A lot of the counties supplement their pay, but not all, and it's not universal. So we would ask, so what we asked for was for, to get them to, I think it was 51,000 actually was request, would have been a request of 1862530. If you see the handout with the $5,000, all, and I say all, all we need is the $450,000 number from that 1-8 request. If we had that, we can get them all to 50 and then we can start seriously being, uh, expecting them to be filled. And that is what we are requesting relative to staff, and it's just staff attorneys, nobody else. I know I kind of went fast. If there's anything that you need to ask me, and I know you have a lot to do, and so I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. I really appreciate you. I'm moving right along. But yes, sir. I got a couple of questions about yes, the law clerks. Number one, and I think you hit on it, uh, my, not coming from the judiciary, my th thought process was that uh, these work permanent jobs and that they turned over probably on an annual basis. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, that, that was some people have that plan. Some yeah. people have it as more structured. I think some of the metro counties do it a little more structured than that. And, and do you have any idea when they got their last pay increase? Whoa. I think, uh, I think they said 2018 for... In 2019, they got the 2% okay. increase that was a COLA, essentially. So they did get that. But before that, it had been quite a while. Right, they, the only increases they received was that other pay increase. Yeah, they've only gotten across the board increases. They've never gotten a position specific increase. And this would be, I know this is a position specific increase, but we need it. Are we competitive with, uh, for young lawyers coming out of school, uh, seeking jobs in other? No, sir. Um, we are, in all honesty, what we sell is we're going to teach you how to practice law, that when you went to law school, you learned the theory of law. Right. We're going to teach you how to do it now and what to file and how to make all that stuff real. Senator Jen Jordan at our, at our uh, meeting Monday reported that, that she had read a report that the starting salary for many of the Atlanta firms is $200,000 a year. So 50, I mean, it, there is just something psychological about let me pay you 42 or 47 versus 50. Just that five in that first digit helps us be competitive, at least for people who feel like they want to do that for a living. I'm sometimes amazed at what the young lawyers will work for. I, uh, I worked at CJCC for five years one time, and we were hiring new uh, assistant prosecutors to do drug courts. And paying them $35,000 a year. I couldn't imagine uh, somebody that spent four years in college and three years of three law years school. in law school and probably had debt, uh, how in the world they could do anything. That's I mean, the you thing. can't have a family. A lot of these kids have a lot of yeah. debt that yeah. come out of law school now. I mean, and it's just servicing the debt is, is a very difficult ask. But thank you, sir. Okay, uh, <clears throat> any questions? Uh, Representative Monahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation today. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a small businessman, and I hate perpetual problems. You know, and I know this is this is a perpetual problem. So let me cut to the chase, and that is, what is the national median salary for a law clerk? What is what is the what is the average nationally? It would be guys? it would to be honest with you, it would be hard for me to tell you because there's so many variables. It, it, you know, what they do in North Dakota versus what they do in New York City versus what they do in California. I know that there has been, I, I talked to Miss Ali the other day, for example, who is your public defender, and she was arguing that the, we are just trying to make our folks competitive with starting ADAs and starting PDs. She had suggested that the starting PD salary should be 65 a year. I'm fine with that. Um, <laughs> that would make us more competitive. No, I, all, all kidding aside, we, nobody's trying to be unrealistic. It is going, when you say a perpetual problem, we're gonna have people who want that job as the fourth year of law school, frankly. You know, the, the internship or the residency, like if you draw a corollary to a medical profession. But we think that if we get this here, we can be, we can hire people to fill these jobs, as particularly in some of the places that we're having a very hard recruitment problem. Southwest, Southeast, et cetera, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Representative Holcomb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I can confirm what you were told by Senator Jordan is uh, I'm a big firm alum, and that is the number. Uh, and so we're 
just worlds apart in terms of being able to attract the best people. And so the question I, I want to ask, and it um, follows up on Chief Justice Namias's state of um, the judiciary, which is we've got a major problem that we have to dig out of, and it's going to take a very, very long time. And would you agree with the proposition that if we could boost the scale up a little bit, we'll be able to maybe keep people a little bit longer. And I understand the trade-off of giving them another year of, of or a great year of training, right. getting to know the judges, but we don't want them to leave as soon as they become efficient. We want them to stay a little bit longer to help us get out of that back hole. You, said, you said efficient, I was thinking valuable. Um, yeah, as soon as they become valuable to us and they learn the things that we need them to do, they leave. And for some people, and, and, and to Colonel Hitchens' point, some people that's the plan. It's just we're going to kick you out of the nest and let you go fly. But we, I really can't expect somebody to give me a two or three year commitment when, when the salary is 47, I think it's 42, nine right now, 42, nine. I, I can't ask you to give me two or three years. You know, I can, I can explain to you why that one year of learning how to file stuff is valuable. Two or three, I can't really do it, 42.9. With the $5,000 raise, that goes to 47.9-ish, and then this, is, this would take it to 50, and we would be very appreciative with, with that consideration because I think it's important for our overall health, frankly. Thank you. Thanks. Any additional questions? We really appreciate it. Thank you, Colonel. Y'all have Thank a good you. afternoon. Thank you. <clears throat> DJJ. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Good afternoon. We appreciate you coming back again. I hope uh, I hope we don't keep you for an hour like we did last time. I'm, I'm going to be short, and I don't know about y'all. <laughs> um, but as you know, we, um, we fully support the governor's recommendation, and everything in the FY23 um, budget is, is pretty much um, mimics the amended budget that you already reviewed and even in the joint session. But I will draw your attention to a question that uh, Representative Smyre had in the last meeting um, that, we, that, we were, that I was before you and in reference to our provider rate increase for our um, um, our. RBWOs are residential placement, and um, our sister agency and DFACs are getting that 10% um, increase in rates. It was a slight oversight, and uh, we were just asking for funding for the for that for that um, for that funding, that 10% increase, and it's a total of 2.3 million dollars. And I can get you the exact number here in just a second. Sorry about that. Where, where is that on here? It's a it's a request, so it's not oh, okay. in your, it's not in your books. Okay. It's an office. It's an, it's an additional request of. Um, of uh, providing that 10% provider rate increase for our child care um, serving institutions that we have. And it's $2,314,528 $2, is the request that we're asking to um, place into the um, FY23 budget. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, that's, that's, unless you have any other questions on the, um, on the budget, I'll, I'll yield the floor to any questions that you may have. Everything mimics the amended budget that we already covered. I don't have any. I think uh, we asked you all the questions we had last time. So, anybody else on the committee got any questions? Hearing none, we appreciate you coming. All right, thank you so much. GBI. Need to learn a few lessons from Commissioner Oliver there. He knows how to get it done, doesn't he? So, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to speak to you, Colonel and gentlemen. Uh, I won't uh, go over the statewide changes. I know most of you are uh, certainly aware of all of those, but I'll move right into the three areas that uh, uh, the governor has recommended in his budget, starting with 30.3.6. That's providing funds for 22 crime lab positions in chemistry, forensic biology, and toxi uh, toxicology. That recommendation includes 15 crime lab scientists, six in chemistry, six in biology, and three in toxicology with five lab techs and two evidence receiving techs. I will tell you that in the majority of backlog at the lab, about 67% of it lies in chemistry with drug cases. And so uh, 
Uh, we'll be putting, hopefully, if this passes, six additional scientists in that area to begin working on it. The second backlog area, about 27% is in forensic biology. We'll be placing six scientists in that as well. Uh, I do want to report to you that our work uh, with the forensic biology section, particularly in sexual assault kits, is paying off based on this committee's work uh, in support of us getting additional scientists. There are 709 kits, uh, sexual assault kits, pending over at the crime lab. 611 of those are actually in progress being worked on. So uh, I'm very pleased with, with that, those results, how we've uh, turned that around, and out of the 709, 611 are actually in some stage of progress. Um, we consider anything a backlog that's been with us over 30 days, and so 531 of those kits are uh, what we consider to be backlog cases just because they've been with us uh, past the 30-day time frame. But I do see a place there with our new scientists hitting the ground running where we're actually going to get uh, to a point with sexual assault kits where we're staying on top of them the way that ideally we, we want to and we should. Again, uh, the overwhelming majority of those are in some form of progress as we work along and try to uh, uh, finish the kits and get those done. I will also tell you, too, that our uh, outsourcing program that you all have graciously supported is working. Uh, we're very pleased with that, with that as well. And uh, I do foresee the day with new scientists on the ground, particularly if, if it works out where they're, they're bumped up with this salary increase that they'll be staying with us longer. Uh, out of the GBI turnover rate, uh, the, the highest turnover rate is with those young scientists, about 9%. Uh, the reality is, for example, uh, I'll give you a great example in our ballistics section. The, the backlog in ballistics percentage-wise is relatively low, but as I've stated before, those are extremely important cases. They're murder cases, they're aggravated assault cases, they're cases where, where there's a, a victim and something needs to be done. It takes us about 18 to 24 months to train up a ballistic scientist to get, uh, uh, to, to get uh, that individual to the stage that we want them to be, to the high standards of the GBI crime lab. And the reality is that uh, our federal friends will swoop in as soon as they're uh, qualified and, and trained and have been to a courtroom four or five times and been qualified as, as an expert, our federal folks will come in, offer them more money for less work. And uh, we're losing them. We're losing ballistic scientists to, uh, to the federal authorities and uh, to the military. And the truth is, I, 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 I try not to say this terribly much, but the truth is I, I can't much blame them, you know, where, when they can go down the street uh, and make more money for less work. And, and so I, I really believe, based on my discussions with the, the crime lab director that that additional bump up in money will go a long way in keeping those young scientists with us. A number of them, as we, con we conduct exit interviews with every person that walks out the door, and in the exit interviews, we've had a number of them tell us, I don't want to leave here. I enjoy it here. It's good work. It's good camaraderie. It's, it's a good place to be. But the truth is, at that young age, um, they're not staying any length of time for retirement purposes, and they're taking those positions that are offered to them. So I, I do want you to know, as, I, as I've told you before, every year that I've stood in front of you, the crime lab backlog numbers in the medical examiner's office, which I'll touch on in a moment, are two of the primary issues that concern me as director, and it's something that we're focused on. Uh, Assistant Director Melvin is with me and CFO Connie Buck, and it's something that I think they would confirm that is extremely high on my radar, but, but I am strongly convinced that with an additional bump up in the money that the legislature is considering this year for all employees, including ours, that, that will go a long way in, in helping those young folks decide to stay with us. And if they do, once we train them, they turn out the work, they churn it out, and, and uh, th they do a good job. They're well respected around the state. As a former prosecutor, I will tell you unequivocally that they help make those cases. Uh, they, they convince juries what to do uh, in, in those cases, and we want to keep them and, and make sure that they stay with us a long period of time. And so uh, these additional positions, along with that potential additional funding, will go a long way in that regard. Speaking of the medical examiner's office, in 30.3.7, uh, in uh, the governor has recommended increased funds for 10 positions in the medical examiner's office, including three new doctors, six uh, death investigative specialists, what we call DISs, and an, uh, and an administrative position. 
I will tell you that we're learning, and I'm learning. Um, I was teasing. We, we have a brand new chief medical examiner. He's coming on with us March 1. I'm extremely excited. It's a gentleman who was one of the original four medical examiners in the crime lab, uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Smith. Dr. Smith was one of the original four doctors hired over there and went out and went to uh, other locations and is coming back with us to run that operation effective March 1. Our newest hire uh, is, is a young lady who is one of our fellows. She actually served a fellowship with the GBI. We currently have two fellows now. I have learned, um, I tease Dr. Smith and my doctors over there, I've learned a lot more about medical examiners than, than I probably ever wanted to, but, but I've learned that in the future we're gonna hire doctors from those fellowship positions. That's where we're gonna get them. My goal, and it's an ambitious goal, but my goal is to eventually make the medical examiner's office into the absolute finest training place uh, in the United States. And we can do that. And I'm convinced we can do it. I'm convinced that we've got the right man to do it in Dr. Smith. We're out recruiting now nonstop for doctors. Um, th these three positions, I'm, I'm so gracious and so, so pleased and proud that the governor has been gracious enough to recommend those. The reality is it's going to be hard to find them. We have about 560, 570 board certified forensic pathologists in the United States for about 1,100 jobs. So the math just doesn't work. And as I've explained to, to my good friends over here, we, we, we're not competing. Uh, we're competing not only against Cobb and Fulton and DeKalb and Gwinnett, we, we compete against Chicago, New York, LA, Houston, Dallas, St. Louis. Uh, and so we, we have to be aggressive. We have to be uh, innovative. We have to have something out there that we're offering that nobody else does. And, and I believe the way to accomplish that is to, is to turn that place into the finest training facility for young uh, pathologists in the United States. And, and I'm convinced we can do it. Uh, uh, I think we have the doctors to do it. Today, uh, Connie just advised me that we were approved today for what's called continued accreditation. Just got the news today. What that means is the accrediting body that allows us to bring fellows in. We can't just bring them in because we want to. We have to have permission to do that. Uh, gave us continued accreditation today, which gives us the authority to bring in additional potential fellowships so we can bring in additional potential new doctors. But to do that, we have to have the, the staff to support that. This recommendation by the governor with these new DIS positions, the new admin positions, the new potential doctor positions does a twofold, has a twofold purpose. It helps us cut into the cases that, that, that are there, the number of bodies that we're seeing day in and day out. And it's been a tremendous uptick at the lab at, at the, at the uh, medical examiner's office. It serves that purpose into helping us attack those numbers, but it also serves the purpose of allowing us to lay the foundation to, to grow that fellowship program. And, and I'm convinced again that in the future, that's where we're going to find young doctors. If we get them here and we get them in the morgue and we get them to work with these, with these really good doctors that we have, and we make that job something that's attractive to those, to those folks, I believe we can keep them. Our newest hire came from a fellowship position. She saw how we did our work and what we did there and, and, and thankfully is staying with us and, and becoming, has become our newest doctor. Uh, the, the, the Emmys work very hard. Again, uh, Mr. Melvin and I are both uh, trial lawyer, prosecutor backgrounds. And, and I will tell you without any hesitation that in homicide cases, a lot of those cases hinge on a medical examiner's testimony. And so those are extremely important positions and, and they, they call it exactly like they see it and I'm very proud of the work they've done. And again, uh, I, I, would, I would strongly uh, gr and, gr and humbly ask that, that, that this committee consider uh, th that request by the governor's recommendation. I think it's appropriate. The last area uh, concerns the investigative section. That's in 30.4.7. That's uh, for positions uh, uh, and associated costs regarding election complaints. Again, the reality is, in, in speaking in full candor with this committee, today, as we, as we stand here, the GBI has no authority to, to conduct any form of election fraud, uh, ballot, alleged ballot harvesting complaints. We, don't, we have no authority to do that. We can be asked to do it. Uh, uh, and, and so I don't know what legislation, how the legislation is going to come out in, in its finality, but it, it, depending on how it comes out, uh, will, will depend on, on, on what we're going to be doing in the future regarding those issues. 
Uh, we, we have seen some proposed legislation. Uh, they've been, uh, the legislators have been gracious enough to allow us to voice our opinion on those and, and to put some language in there that we believe is appropriate. So I do anticipate, uh, again, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't uh, vote on legislation, but I do anticipate based on conversations I've had that when it all shakes out, there'll be some form of authority given to us uh, to, to, to conduct those type of investigations. And so these positions that have been recommended by, by the governor uh, and his folks uh, w would cover those type of investigations. So that's the last item, uh, of the, the relatively new items outside of the statewide changes. And so I would certainly be, be open to any questions if anyone on the <coughs> committee has any. With regard to that, uh, if the governor or the secretary of state uh, direct you to do those investigations, you still don't have any legal authority? Yes, sir. Now, I do if they're if they if we're requested, it would be like any other crime right. colonel where right. we're we're requested, right. we can do them. Yes, sir. Okay. Any questions, uh, on Representative Monahan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am. Thank you, Director Reynolds, yes, for coming out today. Uh, I have been, I've had the pleasure of watching your team work in other committees on the Gold Dome over the last week, and commend you on such a great staff and folks that are helping you over there. I did have a couple questions. I want to keep them Paul and Kenny focused uh, because I, this is what we hear from folks back home. Yes, sir. Uh, number one, thank you for the medical examiners. Uh, the pay, I know you said there's 1,100 people or 1,100 positions. You got 575 people that are, you know, registered licensed to be uh, doing that kind of business. Let me ask you, is our, is our pay, is that, is it comparable, I mean, is it competitive? Yes, sir. You, you all addressed that issue last session and did a tremendous job. And, and as I've stated before publicly, the, the reality is with you all agreeing to bump those doctor salaries up at that point, I didn't know it then, but I later found out literally the week you all approved that, we had two doctors who were interviewing other places, both of whom stayed. Both of whom stayed with us, thank goodness. Uh, and and uh, I, I've actually went as far, uh, Assistant Director Melvin was running point on this, we've actually went as far as reached out to, to a group that, that does a, a, a semi-headhunting uh, job in looking at medical examiners around the country, trying to put people in certain offices, and they indicated to us that currently today our salary is in fact competitive with, with, with most places. Now, we're not going to compete against New York City and, and Chicago and St. Louis literally just doubled their ME salaries, but but we're in the ball in the, in the ball game now, where I'm comfortable telling you that the the salary situation, when we recruit, uh, that's not the issue with us. I, I will tell you that I do think that this body, hopefully sometime in the near future, would consider a discussion on the possibility of, of what I believe would be the proverbial carrot at the end of the stick to get folks here, and that's loan forgiveness. It, it, that, that to me, that's the issue that if, if we can have some fruitful discussion on being able to tell a young doctor, if you agree to serve in, in a statewide capacity as, as a state ME for this many years, there'll be a percentage of, of your loan forgiven. Because I, I know they said a moment ago that a lot of young law students come out with, 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 with heavy loan debts, and they do. We were involved in some research of that when I was the, the DA in Cobb. But these young medical students come out usually w w with about twice the, the amount of loans that law students do. And, and so it's a tremendous mountain that's on top of them when they come out. And, you know, it's similar to the programs that they run for to find rural doctors. Uh, and if we could eventually get to a point where uh, in this recruitment, one of the tools that we have is to say, then you sign up for the GBI for a five-year time frame or a 10-year time frame, this percentage of your loan will be forgiven. I, I do believe that that would be the, the literal icing on the cake because we, you all have done what we asked to do and then some on the salaries, and, and I'm comfortable telling you we're competitive in that area. Mr. Chairman, if I may, just one more question. Uh, that was the number one I got from back home. Number two was uh, I did a ride along with my local sheriff's department, and they're attributing about 50 to 60 percent of the violent crimes that are happening in our community to groups like the Ghost Face Gangsters and the Bloods and the Crips. Uh, these are gangs, you know, that are roaming Paul and Kenny. And is, do you feel that in this budget you have sufficient funds to tackle those? 
because I know it's a big problem in Paulding, and I know it's growing statewide. And we see it, and obviously the governor has addressed it. The House leadership is addressing it, and we want to uh, make sure, I want to make sure that as that kind of scourge is coming towards Paulding County that we're addressing it. Yes, yeah, so th thank you. I, I will tell you that we feel pretty comfortable where we're at at the Bureau. And, I, you know, can we always use more boots on the ground agents? Of course we can. We could always put them to work. The truth is right now we're, we, we've stood up two gang task forces in the state of Georgia. One, the original gang task force, primarily works cases at Atlanta North. Doesn't mean they're not available to go other places, but the one that's most recently stood up was in the Macon Milledgeville corridor working cases, central Georgia in, in, in that area because of some issues we have there. Again, uh, I, I would, I would uh, remind the panel of the committee that to get the GBI in a gang case, for example, if, 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 uh, if, if you and I talked and you said, you know, Vic, there's, there's a gang issue in Paulding, can you help us? We can't set foot over there and start doing anything unless somebody statutorily with the authority ask us to do it. You know, original jurisdiction, and I understand there's a, there's a lot, a lot, lot of, uh, of different uh, uh, opinions in, in that regard, but when we're asked to do it, we, we can roll in the task force that works these cases, and, and the way we work them, we, we, we don't go in and, and work a single person. We, you know, we, we have a saying there that you don't, you know, you don't get the gang by getting the guy, but you get the guy if you get the gang. And so what we try to do is when we roll into an area, it's is, is, is large, complex, um, RICO type, multiple third, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 defendant cases. That's the way you eliminate the problem. And, and, uh, and, and you know, we, we've, in fact, I was talking to, to a, a sheriff this, this afternoon, this morning, way down in South Georgia and said, you know, we can come and help you if you ask us to help you. And so that, that has to be done first. And, and so, but yeah, I, I'm comfortable telling you now that if we're asked, particularly Atlanta North, Macon North, that we, we have the tools available to roll in and help any locals do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course, I'm very familiar with it, but I was wondering if you had any knowledge about how many other states in this country uh, have that originating jurisdiction problem. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I've talked to people from some of the state police states at ICP, and <clears throat> they they have no sense of uh, understanding about uh, why you would have to wait for a sheriff or a chief of police to call you to investigate a crime that very obviously has occurred. Yes, sir. I, I think it's <laughs> I think it's a little unique here. Yes, sir. I'll be I'll say that. Well, I don't. <laughs> I'm not a state employee any longer. I can. I know you. <laughs> 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 Maybe I need my lawyer up here with me. What do you even know? I think I, I will tell you that the GBI. Uh, I think there's a lot of good. I think there's. I think we do a lot of good. I think there's a. I think there's a lot more good we could do. Yes, sir. Representative Holcomb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Director Reynolds. Yes, sir. Uh, first, just appreciate. Um, the continued focus on the timely processing of, of evidence. It's just critically important to um, solving cases and also to prosecuting cases, as you know. So I want to just commend you on that. And I'm, I'm certainly supportive of uh, the increased positions and funding there, and I think that those will, will be really helpful. Um, and in terms of a question, I wanted to just ask about um, the election positions, because unlike um, uh, I think most of the other investigative work that you do, which there is a fairly consistent workflow, it strikes me that the workflow for this may be inconsistent and perhaps even sometimes really low. So would these individuals only work on election issues or would they also be able to work in other areas where there are needs? In other words, would they be like dual-hatted and stuff like that? So That's a great question. I will tell you that th this is the way we've looked at that issue. Uh, in speaking to, to our friends in the Secretary of State's office and who, who work election investigations, I think they indicated to us last year there were about 6,000 complaints of some sort. 
uh, when they weed those down, I think there were about 300 that justified some form of investigation, and out of those, there were a relatively small amount of f four felony referrals. And so what we've tried to do, Representative Holcomb, in, in looking at the legislation that was proposed and was given to us to tweak as what we thought was correct, is we, we've tried to put language in there that limited the GBI's involvement to substantive serious felony issues. Uh, and if we do that, I'm, I'm hoping that if it passes under, under that, under those four corners, that, that our involvement would be relatively limited to the issues that in reality most folks would say the GBI ought to look at that because it's serious, serious stuff and stuff that citizens would be concerned about. What we've talked about doing is if that occurs is to set this unit up to where it's a two-fold unit and in times when non-election years or when election investigations aren't appropriate, they're available to be tasked out either to work with the FBI or to work independently on corruption issues uh, anywhere in the state, and that will take a lot of those issues off of our regional offices. For example, Region 10 uh, here, here, that works the metro area, there's a, there's a lot of cases referred to them that a standalone unit could do in addition to that. I, I will tell you without any, without any hesitation that these individuals will be tasked with additional responsibilities. Uh, and what those responsibilities are will probably depend a lot on where we end up placing them. We, we're a second potential idea for a plan is to train individuals around the state to do election work so they'll be uh, close. For example, if something happened in Scraven County, we wouldn't have to send somebody down there. There'd be somebody relatively close trained up in election uh, issues, but, but they absolutely will be, re will be required to do additional work. We, we're leaning more toward now a separate independent standalone unit that when they weren't working election issues would be available around the state to work corruption cases uh, that I don't think we're doing enough on that uh, we have the potential to get involved in additional cases of that nature if we had the manpower to do it. So this unit will be a twofold unit. It won't be a single election only issue. I would hope and pray that we would not have that much work in that area to do. I, I, I agree and thank you for that context. And the other part of it that strikes me is um, timeliness is always important in justice issues, but for elections it's particularly important because I think there's a five-day clock to file an election contest and so probably what we're trying to do is not just to identify and maybe solve cases but to make sure that the results of the elections are correct, mm -hmm. right? And, and so um, I raise that just in terms of, the, and it's an unknown, but just would the resources be able to surge because they, they would really need to. Like it's finite periods of time when the elections happen, but then the investigations and the decisions would have to be made really, really quickly to help have an impact on reviewing the election, if, if what I'm saying sort yeah, of makes I, sense. It does, and I, I do think that if this, if, if the legislation However, it, it comes out in the end. I, I do believe there's going to still have to be the need for and the requirement for those investigators in the Secretary of State's office to continue doing what they do. Uh, in our conversation with them, they've been very gracious in sharing information with us. One of their strength is, strengths is responding to these, to these, these issues that come up in, in, with a time frame around them. The, the truth is, Representative Holcomb, the way we do investigations with, with, with the deep dives that we do, uh, we generally don't do it with a time frame uh, situation. Uh, it, it's just the nature of the investigations we get involved in. You know, for example, officer involves, we, 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 we really throw enough manpower to give it to a DA within 90 days. That's an officer involved shooting. So something of this nature that has statutory time limits attached to it it's probably going to have to depend initially on, on, on the standalone investigative unit that exists in the Secretary of State's office. I see our involvement as more of, hey, this is a substantive true issue that needs to be investigated and determine whether or not a criminal act or some act occurred. I see that as our role. The, the truth is, if, if, if we were given, pardon me, if we were given the responsibility completely the way the Secretary of State's office is, we, we can't, uh, 6,000, even if only 300 are valid, they looked into those other 
5,700 uh, complaints. You know, I, I don't think that's what we want GBI agents doing. I don't think we can do that. Uh, I, I think the Secretary of State has 23, 24 investigators over there that, that, that can do that and, that we'll continue, and we would work with them in that regard, but I don't want to mislead this committee. My, 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 my take on it is if it's something that, that's tied to a strict time frame, it's going to be very difficult the way we do investigations to turn it around like that. I, I see us more of doing the, hey, this is one of those serious felony, potential felony matters. Give it to us and let us do the deep dive inside of it. Okay. And, and I, the last one, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the, the, what gets talked about a lot in terms of the potential is a cybersecurity incident with elections, and uh, our system has some components that are um, computer-based. Uh, I know that there are some criticisms of, of the current system, but one positive of it is that it does have a paper component, whereas just years ago we didn't. It was just uh, a computer that didn't have any type of trail. Um, and I just raise that as, as, as a question in terms of if there were, say, a cyber issue, would GBI have the resources to do that type of analysis and evaluation, or would that be something you would work in concert with federal officials? Uh, it's um, just I'm intellectually curious about how that would work. I, th I, th I think that there's a number of potential election issues where we would certainly work with uh, our, our partners at the FBI, we have uh, and what, what I think and what I've been told by my friends at the FBI is probably the best relationship we've ever had with them. So we work very closely with them on a number of cases. But I will tell you that we have our own separate standalone cyber unit. Now, yeah. it, it works out of Augusta. And in fact, some of the conversations we've had with Senate about the, uh, uh, it, what was the potential, potential of expanding that cyber unit to, to bring some, some more individual agents, not only to, to the Augusta area, but to the metro Atlanta area as well, because th they're relatively selective right now on the cases they're getting involved in, just because, again, of, of, the, of the time and, and amount of labor it takes to work one of those cases from top to bottom. But, uh, but I'm comfortable telling you that we have that ability now. We have a cyber unit that does tremendous work. It's based in Augusta. And, and we're slowly pushing that out to, to encompass cases uh, uh, west of that in the metro area and, and throughout Georgia. Uh, does it, will it need to grow in the future? Yeah, we'll need to put more agents in that unit to train them up on how to do that. But, but I do anticipate, uh, I'll give you a great example. When we were approached about some potential election issues this time, uh, you know, one of the first things we did was sit down with our FBI partners and, and, and begin looking at it with them because they have some election experts there. They're always uh, made available to us. They said, anytime you need us, we'll, we'll be there to work with you to look at cases. So I'm very comfortable, again, telling the committee that I anticipate it, it, in the future, if we get more involved in these, that when the potential exists for, for concurrent or additional federal investigations or manpower, they will provide it. I'm also relatively comfortable telling you that we have an, uh, the existing cyber unit we have will be able to assist in these investigations as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Judge. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the last year I was a district attorney was in 2010. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just state this. The professionalism that came out of the GBI was bar none. Um, from the lab techs that identified drugs, ballistics, to the case agents and the work that they did in the cases. I was always very impressed with the folks, and I yes, don't sir. think any of that's changed since then. Uh, what I'd like to know, though, is how does your staffing compare to other agencies in other states? Um, and I was just thinking of you have to be invited in. In the other states where they don't have to be invited in, how do you compare with the numbers? You know, it's it, the last ASIA meeting I attended, uh, which is the Association of uh, State Criminal Investigative Agencies, um, uh, was uh, it was sometime early fall. And, uh, and as we went around, the st there were out of the, 50, the 49, 48 or 49 states that belonged to that, uh, there were probably 30 states represented. The, the problems are relatively the same state to state. Um, uh, for example, uh, crime lab backlogs. 
exist in virtually e every state. Um, and, and so uh, the issue of having enough scientists being able to work the cases as timely as you want to is, uh, is an habitual problem in virtually every crime lab uh, uh, th that I've spoken to the directors about. Uh, so that issue is relatively the same. Uh, I, I, again, I do think based on my conversations, and again, I'm a relatively new member to Asia, but in my conversations, I do think there is, there is th th the question the issue of us being a requesting agency is a little odd to a lot of folks, and and they they, they say you know you you're this you're the should be the premier state investigative ag uh, investigative agency in the state, uh, and but I do understand too as a former district attorney that you know that and, and I, I I'm sure that when I was Cobb DA I was a tad bit territorial myself, and so I, I don't condemn any of my friends for for doing that in the law enforcement arena, but. But I do think that that's probably one issue in, in my conversations with some Asia folks where they, they kind of do that at me a little bit when, when I tell them that's, that's how we get involved in, in most cases. We have original jurisdiction in, in a few areas, but, but it's not the areas that a lot of people uh, would, would think we would be ha have original jurisdiction in. And so uh, I do think, though, the problems that we face here, and again, uh, if, if, if I said, you know, list the concerns I have, it would certainly be the backlog at the top and, 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 and eventually getting the medical examiner's office the way I think it should be for the vision I have for the Bureau. But we've been pretty blessed with boots on the ground agents. We, we've always had, uh, you know, I talked to Colonel Wright at the State Patrol. I, I think we're, we're pretty fortunate on our end that we get a number of folks who really want to be GBI agents. And, uh, and, and we, we're, we're blessed in that we get to select a, a lot of the folks uh, that we really truly want. Uh, and so on that, that end, you, you know, we're, we're, doing, we're doing well. Can we always put more boots on the ground guys to work? Sure, uh, no doubt about it. But I think we've learned over the years that the GBI runs pretty lean. I, I think we, and, and, and I think it's worked for us. Uh, there's some areas, you know, if we begin expanding, for example, in, into additional cyber crimes, into additional election issues, obviously we're going to have to have a few more bodies to do that because I don't want to pull folks off of gangs. I don't want to pull them off of crimes against children. And, and, and so, uh, but to, to circle around to your question, and, and I didn't mean to take so long, I do think the problems we, we face are pretty much across the board. Uh, 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 the one area I think we do well in that a lot of folks law enforcement wise struggle with is we generally always have good folks to choose from. Any further questions? <clears throat> I'd just like to make one comment. <clears throat> I really appreciate, I'm from Savannah area, and I really appreciate uh, the work on the rape kits and, and cutting that down. Now, Representative Holcomb carried that bill, and <clears throat> I caught a lot of a lot of negative commentary uh, over the backlog uh, in the three hospitals in Savannah, and uh, that's disappeared, and uh, yes, I really do appreciate that. Well, I, I do know this committee, and, and Representative Holcomb has, has, run, has been point of, of the, the point of the spear on that. He's really concerned about those cases, and, and I've assured him, and will, will assure it publicly that I am too. I do not want any case of that nature. I don't want there to be any backlog. and. But I certainly don't want there to be anyone involved, uh, involving, uh, you know, whether a sexual assault kid is there. We need to get it. We need to work it. Uh, you know, and I think Assistant Director Melvin would tell you we are on that. We're on that all the time, literally, all the time. We're 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 at the lab. What where are we at? What number? Where are our numbers? We get reports uh, fr from them consistently. Uh, we're pushing. Uh, uh, to, to the point about we need to you know we need to get on this we need to bump this down and, and again out of the the cases the overwhelming majority right now are being worked they're in progress somewhere along the lines and and I'm really glad to see that and I'm convinced that as we train more of these young scientists and and, uh, and let them loose to work those numbers will only go down in the three years I've been reporting to you I think we've went from about is either 18 or 1900 down to what we have now and uh, and so we've really, we've really pushed them hard to do that. And John has run point on that for us, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate him doing it. But, but yeah, I appreciate this committee's work on that and their support for us to get those numbers down. And I've spoken to your folks over here. It's, it's always been a, uh, an issue with me about uh, uh, DNA and uh, the limited amount of DNA tests we take for people we're incarcerating when, uh, you know, with fingerprints, anybody that uh, gets arrested, leaves those fingerprints and 
we had a much wider base because everybody goes in the military, everybody gets a background check, and yes, you know, sir. if if I, my view is that if we could get DNA samples like that from a, a wider spectrum of our society, we would solve a whole lot more of these cases. Uh, and I've I, and I've thought about carrying that bill. Mm -hmm. I know it's already been tried once and didn't get very far, but yeah, uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's something to be said for for swabbing of individuals who come into the state prison system sure. and, and keeping that. Uh, as a database uh, because, I, I, again, I, I, that's the way, and I'm gonna hush after this, but that's the way we feel over there. We, we've just started a brand new cold case unit at, at the Bureau. We brought back retired agents, with people with skin in the game, and, and, and they've hit the ground running, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm convinced before the summer is over, we're gonna solve some old cold cases. We, we've got a couple right now right on the cusp of being solved, and. And, 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 you know, I'm convinced that if we devote the attention to those cases, we can provide some closure to these victims' families finally, and, and I'm hoping we'll be successful in that regard. Same thing with DNA. If we have the more DNA we have in a database, I, I'm convinced the more crimes we can solve. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> unless there are any other questions, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you all. Sure. Thank you. Okay.